name is Rahi Lisa from the Department of Professional Development at the Oxford University Press. Today I'd like to talk to you about computers and I'd like to specifically reference the book called Keyboard. It's a book series by Oxford and I'll be delving deep into this book today. I myself am an electrical and electronic engineer. I've studied from the University of Liverpool, UK. Currently I'm working at the City School as a Deputy Manager for Education Technology. Now I'd like to talk to you a bit about computers. I'd like you to take a minute to think of what a computer is to you. What is a computer? Some people when they think of a computer, they think of a laptop or a desktop. Some people think of a mobile phone. Some people think of a Chromebook, Macbook, a Macintosh computer. What is a computer to you? Now, this is a personal question. It requires personalized thinking. And you can uh, figure out what it is to you and it'll be different from what other people think. Could be a desktop, could be a laptop. Okay, so I'd like to just explore the session outcomes. First, we'll be exploring the books and connecting them to the national curriculum. We'll see how to make computers fun and uh, really understand how student-focused learning works. And of course, we'll be exploring k and its various commands. Now, we all know what algorithmic thinking is, so we'll talk about that as well. Here is the series of books, keyboard one, two, three. The teaching guides actually contain the scheme of work, all the lesson plans you need, and of course your questions and answers, along with worksheets and Cyber Olympiad questions. Here are some digital resources. If you go to this website that I've linked below, resource. you can actually find all the students' books and teaching guides on this website. And if you go to tiny.cc slash keyboard, you can also find a bunch of other resources. Right. Now let's just talk about the focus of the national curriculum of Pakistan. What's the first focus? It's computer and information literacy. The second focus is productivity through technology. And third focus is algorithmic thinking and problem solving. These are three standards which serve to define skills and knowledge acquired by every student. These are required skills. First standard, computer information literacy. We all know that by the end of grade eight, students should know how computers work and be comfortable with using them. They should know how to access uh, technology efficiently and they should also understand how e-safety and e-security works. <clears throat> These are the benchmarks. <laughs> Students are expected to recognize parts of a computer and know all the terminology. They should know how to use peripherals and HIDs. They should use proper keyboarding techniques and they should know how to use Windows properly. They should know how to use email and internet and how to communicate. They should know the common uses of technology in daily life. Here is a breakdown of second standard. Students should have the ability to use productivity tools. What are productivity tools? Basic uh, office software basically. So, Paint, Word, PowerPoint, Excel and email. Of course, they should also know how to use multimedia presentations. Here's the third standard. Students should develop understanding of algorithms and they should think algorithmically. What is thinking algorithmically? It's a complex uh, idea actually. We'll explore that later. Here are the benchmarks listed below. You can tell that uh, they're very focused on algorithms, logic, sequence and um, formulations. So basically problem solving. Let's talk about the basics of computers. The first two books cover the basics of computers and it's sufficient for grades one and two. B 
the information is actually displayed pretty nicely in pictures. The do's and don'ts of computing in a well industry is actually quite important. Some advanced concepts are in book three. There's a lot of talk about uh, using logo. I personally prefer to use FMS logo. You can use the turtle to draw things. You can use Microsoft Word. Of course, you, if you know how to use Microsoft Word, you should be able to use pretty much any uh, word editing software. Formatting is quite useful. And using keyboard shortcuts allows you to actually run through things pretty, pretty quickly. These are all incredibly useful for increasing productivity, of course. There's a lot of talk of uh, computer jargon in book four. What is HID? HID is actually hardware input device. So that's where I.O. comes in. What is input output? Think about the use case scenarios of computers. Where would you normally think a computer should be used? This actually connects pretty well to the first question I asked you. What is a computer to you? So if a computer for you is just something that you use daily at office, then the use case scenario is using basic office software. Now, some people might think that a computer can be used in a lot more things and they'd be right. Pretty much all industry is using computers. All levels of automation require computers. We are now past that era where electromechanical automation used to be in pretty much all consumer appliances. So an automated teller machine or an ATM is actually using a computer. I think uh, pretty much all of us have seen the screen and it looks pretty familiar. It looks like a very old operating system that's running. But actually on the underside, Majority of ATMs are running on Windows. It's very important to know how Windows 7 and Windows Explorer work. Of course, now we're on Windows 10 and uh, it's slowly and surely upgrading everything from Windows Explorer. Here's an, another link for you guys. Um, it's called calorman.com JS logo. This is uh, a web-based turtle. Of course, if you like, you can also use FMS logo, or you can use uh, Logo Turtle, which is a Chrome extension. There are a lot of different variants available, but today we'll be using the KDE version, which is a Linux variant of Logo. It runs on the KDE backend. It's called KTurtle. Okay, let's talk about PowerPoint and Word. So, one of the most important questions that I keep getting, or one of the most uh, common questions that I keep getting when I'm talking about PowerPoint and Word uh, in front of students. Students think, they just ask me, you know, what is the point of me learning this? You know? So it's a really important thing to note that, uh, note down for students what the students are required to do, where they'll be using PowerPoint, and when they'll be using Word, and more specifically, tables in Word. You know? It's important for us to uh, give them some ideas on the use case scenarios of the softwares and skills that are being taught. As uh, they are the smartphone generation, they're very, like, uh, very unlikely to actually use computers outside of school. So it's uh, really, really important for them to know why they're actually learning this. Let's take a look at the history of computers now. Now, book five actually talks a lot about the history of computers. Can anybody, does anybody know what the first computer is? I mean, if you think about it, what is the first computer? What was the actual first computer? A lot of people talk about Charles Babbage's difference engine, and they'd be right in saying that, yes, that is the world's first computer. However, that was just a calculator, if you think about it. And if we're talking about calculators, then I'd say the world's first computer was actually an abacus. Now, the Chinese abacus was the oldest abacus, and the Japanese abacus is the soroban, which I actually prefer to use because it's much simpler to use. Let's talk about some of the people who were involved in actual computing. 
Pascal. Blaise Pascal. Who was he? He was a mathematician. He was a great mathematician. He built 20 of these machines that we call Pascal's calculators. He's also considered one of the people who have invented the first mechanical calculator. He's well known for his work on, the, on Pascal's triangle and scientific method. So, quite a progressive mathematician and uh, quite paramount to the history of computing. Then of course we have Charles Babbage. We all know Charles Babbage invented the difference engine and only uh, a few years back we managed to recreate his creation from his patent and his patent actually had some uh, problems in it that he had put in on purpose just to make it more difficult for somebody to recreate it. Then we have Ada Lovelace, Countess Lovelace. She worked with uh, on Charles Babbage's machine, the analytical engine, and uh, she is known to be the first person to create the algorithm. So some would actually argue that she is the reason why computers exist today and use algorithms. So computers were mainly used to perform mathematics. And I personally believe that math teachers can really benefit from using computers in the teaching of mathematics. Okay, so let's move on to some acronyms. <clears throat> we all know these wonderful acronyms. RAM, ROM, PROM, EPROM, WEPROM, HDD, FDD, SSD, CD, DVD, BD, USB. It's a bit complicated, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, it's very normal to expect students to know what RAM, ROM, and all these other things are, but it's very unlikely that anyone will see a lot of these things. So, USB is common now, universal serial bus. We just think of USB as a USB drive, but USB is something else entirely. BD also a defunct format, as is pretty much all the optical media, DVD, CD, HDD, we still use hard disk drive, now FDD, floppy disk drive, it's part of history of computers and students are unlikely to have ever seen one. In fact, it's very unlikely that the people who are watching this would have seen an FDD. An SSD is now a very common thing, solid state drive. In fact, all our mobile phones technically use solid state storage, which we like to call flash storage. In fact, this is actually very well connected to this electrically erasable program on read only memory. All right, let's move on to the internet. So the most important thing that students need to know about, especially these days, where internet usage is ubiquitous and having a cell phone, having an Instagram account, having social media accounts is so common they, that everybody should know about their own security. You wouldn't want to go to a bad location at a bad time because you may catch somebody's eye, you might be in the wrong place at the wrong time and that can be dangerous. The internet is unfortunately full of bad locations and everybody on the internet has um, a certain level of anonymity which allows them to behave in a way that they would not normally behave with uh, in real life. Of course, um, there are some people who abuse the power of the internet and they abuse the anonymity that it offers them. It's very important too be aware of those threats and know how to avoid falling victim to them. So this is something that's very useful. Having students name a few adults that they can trust and they can call and ask for help in case they're met with a situation that they're unfamiliar with. There are many videos on YouTube that you can go through and you can uh, decide which one is good for you in your situation because it's important that students know who they trust and who they can trust. And here is a part of the national curriculum. 
Let's move on to some more Excel and a bit of publish. Book 6 really focuses on the advanced Excel features. Using conditional formatting is actually pretty useful. I find that uh, whenever I use conditional formatting, it's always been um, beneficial in making certain aspects of information more visible than others. Now, Publisher. What is Publisher? Microsoft Publisher. Why would anybody use Publisher when they have something like PowerPoint? What's the difference? Well, Publisher is actually uh, more of a tool for actual publications. So if you want to create a magazine, or you want to create a brochure, you would want to use Publisher. However, you can use PowerPoint if you're just making a basic brochure. Uh, Publisher is far more sophisticated and more advanced. Some people I know have actually made their publications on Microsoft Word simply by using the drawing canvas because the drawing canvas essentially is like a little sheet from PowerPoint and in there you can move all the images around as you like. Okay, I'd like to talk a bit about basic. What is Visual Basic? You can use Visual Basic to make simple programs that run on computers. Of course, the other things that you can also use are Flash and HTML5. HTML5 has largely replaced Flash, especially in uh, internet as as applications, or internet aspects. Let's talk a bit about Microsoft Access. What is Access? Access is a database software. I've used a lot of databases in my life, especially when it comes to tabulating large amounts of data. And I know that companies like Teradata and Exadata work with massive databases. These databases require server rooms. They require really powerful hardware just to access and maintain them. And uh, they supply these databases to companies that require handling of big data. Big data is what we, we call huge amounts of uh, data that's put into a, a database. And the most difficult part of actually working with any database is the data staging. I can give you an example. When I was working on wind power, there was a time when a lot of data was coming in from the wind masts. These masts are used to just log all the data at different heights. The data has um, wind speed, temperature, humidity, wind direction, and uh, it has time. It has a bunch of other information that uh, is not always necessary, but I'm just going to talk about the basic information that I mentioned. It was quite difficult to just open all these files. They were comma separated value files, CSV files. And uh, if I just kept opening every file into Microsoft Excel, which is where they normally tend to open, it was getting very difficult and very tedious to go through all these files because I was getting one file per day uh, for every two minutes. That's quite a lot of information, quite a lot of files, considering that I had five years of data. So I created a little batch file that automatically opened all these documents, all of these CSV files, but not in Excel, in a notepad editor, in a text editor. And it concatenated all the data together and removed the data that I didn't need. And it uh, just kept the data that I needed and uh, it appended it in a way that was very easy to connect together. And I had one file that had the data for five years. You can imagine how large this file might have been. Then I connected this file to a database in Microsoft Access and I asked it to query this file and give me specific data. And it didn't matter that the files had data that was wayward. Some data was uh, arranged badly. So let's say that if there was some data for today, in the, after that, there should be data for the next day. However, in the case of this text document, that wasn't the case. There was some data from a year ago, three years ago, and it was just up and down, but it all had timestamps. And I used that in the database to 
properly organize everything. And at the end, I had uh, the ability to extract the information from that database. That, that is effectively what that was. And convert that into what's known as the wind rows, which told me how much wind goes in what direction for how much of the year. And using that information, I created a feasibility study. And I told the company that I was working for at that time, that yes, uh, this, com this particular area has decent amounts of wind and you can easily put up a wind power plant over here and you can earn money in three years after which uh, you will have paid back your entire project. And I have the data to support it. Okay, now let's talk about uh, audio. My favorite audio editor is called Audacity. It's a free audio editor. It's not just free, it's also an open source audio editor. Open source means that the source code for this uh, audio editor is actually available on the internet. And that means that it's completely open to be modified as anybody wants. I could download the source code, I could go through it, I could add and remove things, I could even explore the source code and see what's going on, what's happening, which means that it's a safe software because there's a lots of eyes that are on this particular source code and anybody can see what's going on inside and anybody can add different modules to it and delete things from it if it were if it had any adware or malware in it we would be able to see that which is why free and open source software is a good idea now it supports lots of effects and you can actually use it to compress and bring out sounds I've used Audacity quite a lot, especially when I've been in meetings and I've had to record that meeting, at least the audio of that meeting, and a person who would be sitting far away from me during that meeting, his voice would obviously be quite low and I couldn't ask him to speak up. So I let my microphone pick up as much sound as it could and later on I went into post-processing in Audacity where I could bring out his particular voice and isolate it and increase the volume. It's really useful. All right. Here's a nice little important thing. Books mention computer etiquette. Computer etiquette is actually quite an important thing. Now, these ideas are uh, mentioned throughout the books constantly. It's really useful to have these ideas. Uh, instilled in our youth because we've noticed that now that uh, we have mobile phones pretty much everybody takes these mobile phones wherever they want and um, they can touch them with dirty hands if they like it goes into their pockets it comes out it touches their face it gets covered with their face oils and their finger oils and uh, it is actually pretty much full of bacteria so um, that is something that we should focus on and we should tell uh, people in general that it's important to make sure that our devices are clean and uh, spe more specifically our computers because computers have not, not been manufactured to the standards that mobile phones have. Mobile phones tend to have a bit of water resistance and dust resistance but laptops do not. So it's very important to keep your laptop and your computer clean, not to eat food or drink anything in front of the computer because if you drop it onto the computer, it's gone, it's dead. If you drop water into a keyboard, it's unlikely that that keyboard will work anymore. And especially if that keyboard is a laptop keyboard because then the water is actually going into your laptop computer and onto some critical components. Modern laptops tend to have batteries built in so you can't even unplug a battery if anything goes wrong. So it's actually not the water that kills the device, it's the electricity that's passing through which creates short circuits and um, other different effects. Okay, let's move on to uh, Gator. Here we are. What are the most important parts of using Kturtle? If you've used Kturtle before, you know that some of the most basic commands in Kturtle 
our let me see if I can write these down there's FW which we know stands for forward there's also BW there's TR which is turn right there's TL and there's also EU which is pen up and of course pen down PD okay so now I want you to open K turtle I'm sure you have K turtle it's it was linked in the slide earlier you have to run kturtle.exe which is actually in the bin folder and if you run it you should be able to see the turtle in the should be able to see the turtle in the center of the screen there he is right here so he's actually a sprite yeah a sprite is actually a tiny little image that can move around and be animated and can modify itself. It's part of the old computer programs that we actually use in games. Okay, he also has a pen. That means that you can use him to write stuff. The key ideas of actually using KTurtle is because it enhances student understanding of coding and algorithms. So if you use KTurtle, if you use any uh, form of uh, programming, you have to understand how coding works and how algorithms work because pretty much all programs require loops and commands. Now, this also teaches about cause and effect. Cause and effect is actually quite a complex idea, but it can be explained using logo. However, it needs to ex be explicitly mentioned. It also talk, uh, connects the concept of dependency and multiple solutions. What does that mean? Let's take a look. Here's a little story. Okay. So these are three different things that boy will do when repairing his tire. He has a flat tire in his bike. So the first thing he'll do, which one should be the first thing that he'll do? Can anybody figure that out? Yeah? All right, let's take a look. The first thing he'll do is he'll get a puncture kit and then he'll repair the tire. Then he'll fill air in the tire. Now this is very simple and it's uh, quite obvious. And do you think that there may be multiple solutions to this problem? Well, actually, I don't think there should be multiple solutions, but multiple paths. For example, it's not possible to repair the tire. Then the only thing that one can do is you can get a new tube. Then they can insert the new tube. However, the final, the final step is actually the same as before, filling air in the tire, because that is a constant in this situation. Now, if the person who is actually filling the air in the tire doesn't know how to do any of this stuff, doesn't know how to insert a new tube, does not repair the tire, well, they could just do what pretty much everybody does these days, go to the puncture repair shop. So, multiple paths, multiple ways of solving the same problem and dependencies. You can't insert a new tube without getting a new tube. You can't fill air in the tire without inserting that new tube. Similarly, you can't repair a tire without getting a puncture kit. Of course, in this case, there's only one step. And then it's not us or it's not the boy who's actually doing any of these things, it's the person who works in the repair shop. Okay, let's let's take a look at some commands, right? On KTurtle.
So if you take a look at all these, right? The first one is reset. What does reset do? It's a way of clearing the screen. And canvas size, 200, 200. So this is actually setting the canvas to be 200 pixels by 200 pixels wide. 200 pixels wide by 200 pixels tall. And here is the canvas color, 000. zero, zero. I wonder what that is. Hmm, we'll find out soon enough. Setting the pen color to 25500. Zero, zero. And the pen width to 5. Now, 5. What is 5? Well, once we execute this command, we'll figure it out. Go 2020. This means that the turtle is going to go to the position 2020. And their direction will be 135 degrees. So, 2020 is actually going to be from the top left of the screen. You will see that in a minute. I'm going to tell the turtle to move forward 200. That is 200 pixels. Turn left 135 degrees. Forward for 100. Turn left 135. Forward for 141. Turn left 135 again. Forward 100. Turn left 45. And then go to 40 and 100. Let's see what that actually does. So here we have the key turtle. Let me just type all these commands in. Here we are. All right. All the commands are in. Now, if you like, you can save them. And then later on, you can open it as you like. So now what you need to do is you need to click on run. Because run will run all these commands in the editor. Oh, look what happened. So the turtle seems to have gotten bigger. And that's because we changed the size of the canvas. The canvas used to be a little bigger than this. Now it's smaller. It's 200 by 200. The canvas color is 000, which is black. So this is 0 red, 0 blue, and 0 green. The pen color is 235 red and 0 of the others. So therefore, it's just pure red. 255 is the highest number you can have in this value here. The pen width is 5. That's 5 pixels. Go to 2020. This point here is 2020. This is where the turtle went first. And then its direction was 135. So it pointed this way, in this direction. And then it moved forward 200 pixels. That's right across still here. After which it turned left and moved forward 100, turned left again, moved forward 141, turned left again, moved forward 100, and then turn left 45, which is actually kind of pointless because, well, you know, turning it left 45 just makes it point up this way. But then we moved it to go to 40, 100, which is this point here. And now look, the turtle is facing this way. Look kind of nice. Okay, so if I want to clear all this, I can just do reset and run that. And look, the turtle is back to where he was. Okay, see? And let's take a look at some more commands. All right. So let's write these commands down in turtle. What do you expect is going to happen? Let's go through the code together. First we reset, obviously, just to clear the screen. Then change the canvas color to 255 red, that's maximum red, 55 green, which is a bit of green, and 140 blue, which is quite a lot of blue. Does that mean that it's going to be a purplish pinkish color? Yeah, maybe, because red and blue makes purple. Now we're going to change the pen color to 160 red, no green, and full blue, 255 blue. So that's going to be a nice darker purple, nice contrasting shade. Change the pen width to 3. Now notice that we haven't changed the canvas size at all. So the canvas is going to be the size that it is defined at, predefined at. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the repeat command. Repeat command is actually really important to know because it allows you to actually repeat things that are happening again and again. So I'm going to repeat eight times whatever's happening, whatever's contained 
in this curly bracket that actually ends all the way down here. So that means that all these commands that are inside this repeat are actually going to be repeated eight times. And you'll see why that matters. I'm going to repeat four times. 4, 20, turn right, 30. So I'm using the full versions of the commands rather than the short concatenation. 4, 20, turn right, 30, repeat that four times. I wonder what that's going to make. Then I'm going to repeat seven times over 10, turn right 15. Hmm, that looks like a smaller moving, movement forward and a less sharp turn. Kind of a sharper curve maybe? And then we'll repeat nine times forward three and turn right 10. Ooh, very sharp turn. Hmm, interesting. Repeat all of that eight times. Let's see what that looks like. Of course, I'm gonna then move the turtle out of the way by making him go to 145, 145. Let's still take a look at what that looks like. Oh, it makes a nice little spiral with oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 loops. So each one of these is actually based on the repeat command. And the final turning actually made it point in a different direction, which made it move this way. That's pretty cool. You can create hundreds of different things like this. I'm going to go through a few of these with you right now. Okay, so let me start typing some of these. I set the canvas size to pretty large and I make it go right to the middle of that canvas okay and I'm gonna make it you create a nice little spiral let's run it and see what that looks like oh wow it's taking quite a long time isn't it it's actually running all that it's making another one making another one hmm how many times how many times will it make this it'll make it as many times as you want it to because I'm using some variables it's quite a complex little program and it's using some random numbers everywhere that'll keep running okay so let's just abort that we go and let's type reset yep. I'm just gonna type down some commands over here okay now what I've done is I've created another command another program called coach because I'm gonna create a coach card see how good that looks First I set the canvas size pretty large and now look, it's actually drawing a bunch of stuff. Going pretty crazy, doesn't isn't it? So you can actually create all these different levels of tessellation by using Tricator and some ingenuity. And all of these uh, commands are available on the internet if you search for them well enough. Of course, you can also make them yourself. Right? Let's try one more. This is known as Serpinski's triangle. It looks pretty familiar to some of us who are mathematicians. And it's actually even more familiar to any of us who are in fashion design 
and interior design or arts and architecture because this is something that's used quite a lot by designers and artists. It's all about tessellations. All right, I'm going to stop that now. Okay. Oops, errors. This is why I prefer using KMS logo because, uh, sorry, FMS logo because it doesn't have as many errors as uh, K Turtle does. Yeah. All right. So, have any questions? Well, I'll be waiting for them. Thank you very much for watching. That'll be all.